OK. When you go on the website for the class, right, the syllabus is on here. When you sign in, you will get the email of the TAs. It doesn't show up unless you sign in. Uh, and if you, what I just wanted to show you is that if you go, for example, to week one, you will get the reading. If you sign in, let me just do this to show you how it works. You sign in, and you will see below. Do you see where it is, where the cursor is? You will see below the lecture outlines as we go along. I will lecture each time, and you can print it out ahead of time. It's a one-page outline in Word. So print it out ahead of time. Try to get this thing place where it's out of my way. Uh, and that'll give you an overview. If you've missed a lecture, it will give you a summary of the lecture. But of course, you will also have the audio podcast, the video podcast, and the YouTube broadcast at some point. OK. So just a little tiny bit. I've been playing you a little bit of the, the magic flute. The reason I picked Mozart is he is a perfect exemplification of music during the Enlightenment. I've picked the magic flute from 1791 because it is famous for its Masonic elements, that is, the Freemasons. If you go and see angels and demons when it comes out, it will have reference to these kinds of secret societies. I'm going to talk about it in the lecture. Mozart was a Freemason. And the opera is seen as being highly symbolic. So just a tiny bit. This is, the, I believe, the Queen of the Night. OK, if you were here at the beginning, you saw the symbolic elements of the opera that show up in the overture. So there are all kinds of reference to, to masonry in the course of the opera. We're going to get to the Freemasons a little later on. Freemasonry being an example of the building of civil society in the 18th century. And we're going to spend a little bit of time on that today. OK, I said that we would talk about what chapter opens with Catherine the Great as a picture. Uh, this time I have the picture going the same way that it goes in the textbook. I pointed out that the web sometimes reverses, and in fact, textbooks sometimes reverse of the picture. Why is okay. I'm going to try something else. Try turning off this. OK, I think it's probably the two microphone systems are competing with each other. That's my thing. That was not it. I am not moving. You think? I don't think so. Maybe. That, that would be really cool. I like to see the pictures big, too. OK. <laughs> Why did I pick Catherine the Great? Other than political correctness of pointing out that there are women who matter during the Enlightenment. Well, at least two different reasons. One is that women do matter during the Enlightenment in ways that are extremely important for the future of Western history and, indeed, for the conflicts of today. It becomes a signature of Western social life that women are not living in seclusion. 
yes, there will be big struggles about this. You will read about them in the textbook, about how much women should stay at home. But certainly in this period, we have many prime examples of women not staying at home, and Catherine is in many ways the most interesting of them. If only because she probably had her husband killed so that she become supreme ruler of Russia, her husband being the Tsar. She was a German princess who spoke no Russian and was a Lutheran. She learned Russian for her new position and converted, of course, to the Russian Orthodox Church, had her husband killed, and ruled Russia in surprisingly successful, successful in quotation marks, fashion during her very long rule. That is, she never lost power. She herself was not killed or removed from power. She was able to rule even, and this tells us incredibly interesting things about the state of monarchy in the 18th century. That you could become a monarch by somewhat questionable means, as long as you had the right family relationship, in her case, wife, and that you could exercise an enormous amount of power just because your family relationship brought you to this position. But it also tells us that those family relationships were very fragile. Czars of Russia killed their heirs when they were mad at them on occasion. There were palace coups of various sorts throughout the 17th and 18th century. And it was always a problem if a woman came to power. This is, of course, true especially for the Empress yeah, Theresa in Austria, whose coming to power unleashed a war in Europe. We're not going to linger long on the war in Europe, any of these wars in Europe, but we will, we will talk about them in passing, and the textbook will give them you in much greater detail. Now, fascinatingly about Catherine in this picture is that for her power to be apparent, she is wearing the military form of one of the leading Russian regiments. So even she must make a claim to military leadership, even as a woman. So she's on a horse, the way are always shown. Oh, this is driving me totally insane. Uh, she's on a horse, and she's wearing military, a military outfit. Okay. This noise. Oh. <laughs> this is being in prison. Okay. As you see, she was ruler for 34 years, through the height of the Enlightenment, and well into the French Revolution. She is interesting as well because along with Frederick II of Prussia, she is one of the two monarchs most famous for befriending the leaders of the Enlightenment, especially the French leaders of the Enlightenment, and in her case, Voltaire and Diderot. She bought both of their libraries on their death. As a result, their libraries are in Moscow. And she was in personal correspondence for years in particular with Voltaire. And you have a quote from one of her letters in the textbook. The other reason, it's not just about women and their importance in the Enlightenment, as we will see, they have an exceptionally important role during the Enlightenment. It's not just that, but it is not just that the Enlightenment gains the support of rulers, but it also raises the issue of why is someone like Catherine the Great interested in the Enlightenment? When she rules a country in which the population is 80 to 90 percent peasant, and almost all of them are ensurfed, almost like slaves to their lords, she will try to introduce modernization 
to Russia, but she will have a very clear sense of how far to go with it. She will never challenge serfdom. She will maintain the nobility in a dominant position. She will try to reform the law codes. She will try to introduce into educational reforms. She, like Frederick II, believes in reform from the top, not from the bottom. The big issue in the Enlightenment would be who will get control of this originally intellectual movement, then increasingly social movement, and by the time of the American Revolution, a political movement. Okay. We could do an analysis of every picture in the textbook. We don't have time for it, which is why I send you to the website. One picture in each chapter has an entire set of activities along with it. It's kind of fun because if you move your cursor over the picture in question on the website, it tells you information about the picture. It may be a picture you will discuss in section. Remember I said last time, you want to be thinking each chapter, why is the order of the chapter the way it is? The four sections of this chapter are one, about the people and their ideas, two, about the structure of society, three, about state power, and four, about the rebellions against state power. So this chapter seems to be arguing that ideas can drive events. In other chapters, we will see the emphasis will be on economics or the emphasis will be on politics. We want to get away from an interpretation that says it's always economics that shapes politics, that shapes ideas. Sometimes it's the other way around, and I think the Enlightenment is in a particularly strong example of this. So I want to argue this is not an arbitrary arrangement of the chapter, but rather one that suggests the different ways you can do historical interpretation. That brings me to why is the contrasting views in this chapter about women in the Enlightenment? Because as I said, the issue of women becomes particularly pressing during the Enlightenment. Peter the Great in the early 18th century in Russia, in order to modernize Russia, in a chapter preceding the one that's in your book, orders noble women to participate in social gatherings with noble men. Already by the early 18th century, it is seen as a signature of modern European life that women participate in public gatherings. They don't just stay at home. Now, some of these public gatherings are not exactly public because they're actually in their living room. But the idea is that women, the participation of women, changes the nature of social relationships. Now let's think about that. Why would the participation of women change social relationships? OK, it's not just because it means everyone is interested in sex. Leave that answer out. OK? Try a different answer. Why, 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 and why is this such a big issue now? This is a big issue in Western attitudes towards Islam, what the role of women is. So now what is it about? Why would Peter the Great want to have women participate in public gatherings? Why is that modernization? Austin? Well, yeah, OK. But Peter the Great, maybe not the biggest believer in equality, since he's certainly interested in maintaining serfdom. But that's, that's good. I mean, the point is that we have a hard time grasping this. Uh, for us, the fact that there are women present in this classroom as well as men, we take for granted. Not to be taken for granted in the 18th century, since women were not admitted to any university in Europe in the 18th century. Okay, and not to most of them in the 19th century either. Okay. Virginia Woolf in the 20th century couldn't go to the university, like her brothers. So we're not talking complete equality here. 
It's a way of getting past society dominated by warrior values, fighting values. It's a way of softening society. It's a way of saying the nobles are not here just to fight wars. They have to be cultivated. They have to have manners. They have to learn etiquette. They have to learn foreign languages. They have to learn how to dance. They have to learn how to converse. Civilization is culture. It's conversation. It's polite conversation. Women are crucial to teaching men how to have polite conversation rather than simply saying, give me what I want or I will hit you. Okay, so it's part of changing values away from one kind of society to another kind of society. And everyone noticed this. In the 1750s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, when Scottish philosophers began to write about the stages of civilization, they thought Europe was superior because it had greater commercial wealth, but also greater commerce, the word they used, between the sexes. Women being incorporated into social life was for them a sign of advancement and therefore copied by places like Russia who wanted to be more like Western Europe. So the issue about women in the Enlightenment is not just a feminist issue. What should the role of women be? It is a crucial issue in this period. OK. We have now 50 minutes to get down what is truly the foundation of this course. This course is about whether enlightenment values, AKA modernity, is a good thing or a problematic thing. Therefore, we must know what enlightenment values are, and we have to know where they come from. So what is the enlightenment? One page. First, above all else, it looks very much forward to our era of globalization in that it is a time when intellectual life is truly cosmopolitan. Unlike the era of globalization, however, the language everyone knows is not English. What is the language everyone knows? French. Catherine, German princess who knows Russian, writes to Voltaire in French. Hume writes to Rousseau in French. Everyone who is educated knows French, the way now, increasingly, everyone who is educated knows English. Because no matter who you want to talk to in the world, you can talk to them in that language. Today, I got an email from a student at a university in Bulgaria, in English, telling me about his new blog on human rights because he'd seen my YouTube lecture on human rights. If he'd written me to me in Bulgarian, I would have had no hope of having a conversation with him. He can have a conversation with me because he can write to me in English, even though he's originally from an Armenian family forced to flee Turkey to get away from the uh, pogrom against the Armenians. So English is now the lingua franca. French was this way in the 18th century. So the movement involves intellectuals everywhere from the English colonies, the British American colonies, with Benjamin Franklin being a prime example, to Moscow, especially St. Petersburg, with Catherine the Great being on the other end. It included clergymen, aristocrats, and commoners. 
A third of the people corresponding with Rousseau, son of a watchmaker, were European nobles. It crossed class lines. It crossed national lines. It crossed religious lines. It was seen as an international movement. Now, we could say in a word it was an international movement for human rights, but they didn't use the term in the 18th century. So we will have to say it is instead an international movement for applying reason to all problems of this world. So number two, standard of truth is reason. Not the Bible, not religion, not the political or religious authorities, not what you've done in the past, not any kind of tradition. It's reason, reason, reason. Now, since it is the foundation of the university today, it is very hard for us to grasp that this could possibly get people agitated. You would agitate people a lot more if I came into this class right now and said, the only standard of truth in this class is the Bible. And anybody who doesn't believe that can just leave now. This would be troublesome, especially to those who were not Christian or Jews who believed, in, at least in some part, of the Bible. In the 18th century, to say it is only reason was a challenge to religious traditions, and it was implicitly a challenge to political authorities, as we will see. If you applied reason and derived, for example, as Rousseau did, the notion that all men are equal, the entire social hierarchy could be called into question. So this is enormously important. Why does it become important? Just at this time in the 18th century, it is because of the successes of the scientific revolution. We don't have time to go over Descartes, Galileo, Kepler, or even Newton, but I will at least say the word Newton. Because Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, published in Latin, and therefore read only by those who knew Latin in addition to English and French. Therefore, Newton's work was actually only understood by a handful of people at the time. Nonetheless, it was immediately recognized as an enormous breakthrough. Principia Mathematica, 1687. Why was it an enormous breakthrough? Because it provided the law of universal gravitation, which explained motion on Earth and in the heavens. It explained the motion between the planets as well as motion on the ground. It provided a unified theory of physics. It had an interesting irony in it, because though in some ways it was an entirely secular concept, explaining the motion of bodies hitting other bodies and how that worked, it had still this somewhat mysterious element, which disturbed many commentators. Gravity cannot be seen. It can be measured, but you cannot see gravity. And for some, this was troublesome because it meant there was still a kind of imaginative element involved. So some people resisted Newton into the middle of the 18th century. But it was clear that Newton had, that an individual mind had unlocked the secrets of the universe and was superior in explaining the universe to the Bible, to Catholic authorities, for that matter, to Protestant authorities, to political authorities. The mind could independently understand these things through mathematics and physics. Therefore, reason, it turns out, was an immensely powerful instrument. 
And so you have the encyclopedia document in the textbook, which explains the position of the encyclopedia, the single most famous work of the Enlightenment, published between 1751 and 1772. In, now, you, if you saw it in my office, the facsimile of it, these huge, heavy volumes organized alphabetically, you would say, this is exciting? It was exciting, the encyclopedia, because it brought together all the knowledge known of the day in one place. And it sneakily put subversive ideas in its footnotes and in obscure articles. Starting with A, the French article AM, A-M-E, for Soul, written by a clergyman, but which seemed to suggest that there was no such thing as soul. There were only bodies in motion. So in 1751, the encyclopedia was suppressed by the French government. Its publication was forbidden. And it had to be published for the next 10 to 15 years secretly in places like Amsterdam and Switzerland and smuggled into France. So the idea that you could raise any idea and have it discussed is a radical idea. And the encyclopedia basically says, we must discuss everything. We must subject everything to reason. Its intellectual heroes then were Isaac Newton and John Locke who wrote at the same time as, as Newton, published his two most famous works in 1690, right before the beginning of the 18th century. Newton, I've already explained. Voltaire, for example, wrote an entire book explaining the physics of Newton to a popular audience. In fact, the person who wrote the hard parts of the book was his lover, Madame de Châtelet, but because she actually knew more physics than Voltaire. Still, Voltaire's book in the 1730s brought these ideas to a more general audience and caused a great stir in France. Locke was the other hero, but he was not the hero for the second treatise that we read about in the cluster in the fall. He was not the hero for arguing that Government should be based on consent of the people. That would become a, an important idea after mid-century. But already after 1690, Locke is a hero for his essay on human understanding, his essay concerning human understanding of 1690. Likewise, like the encyclopedia, to us today, a staggeringly tedious book because it's written in 17th century English, because it's written in a way that's kind of hard for us to get into, but it made a radical point. The mind is a blank slate, a tabula rasa, he used the Latin term. The mind is a blank slate, meaning we are not born with original sin, might be an implication, we are not born with anything. We are born with a blank slate. Experience creates who we are. It's not innate ideas. It's what we learn. It's the environment we live in. Locke started the nature versus nurture debate, which we still have today. Indeed. We actually no longer believe that the mind is a blank slate. We believe in lots of hard wiring. But Locke's position was radical for the time because he said, anybody can become anything with the proper education. Bad ideas are the product of bad education. Locke therefore opened the world to the whole modern educational movement. It is why you are here today. 
So Locke's theory about the mind had incredibly radical consequences. It implied aristocrats are not different by birth. Locke was a medical doctor and quite a learned man. People are different by education, not by who their parents are. They don't inherit anything, is essentially what he's saying. They are blank slates. Progress is possible. Perfection is possible. OK, a brief chronology. I like to divide it into three main periods, the origins, the beginnings, and the high point. We don't have to linger on this at great length. The origins I like to trace, of course, to Newton and Locke. Newton, 1687. Locke, 1690. But there's a political event, too. In 1685, the French king, Louis XIV, revokes the Edict of Nantes that had given toleration to French Protestants for a century. In 1685, Louis XIV announces that Protestants in France will either convert or go to jail. It is illegal to leave the country, except for Protestant ministers who must leave the country within a few weeks. Except they can only take their older children with them. I mean, I'm sorry. Yes, their older children with them. They have to leave their younger children behind to be raised Catholic. 150,000 French flee in order to remain Protestants. Troops are garrisoned in towns of Protestants. Troops surround Protestant churches and say, convert now, or we will burn down the church, possibly with you in it. I mean, we're not talking about a mental situation here. We're talking about a situation that is the first organized example of an incredible persecution of a minority. 150,000 French flee. Many of them flee to Amsterdam and the Dutch Republic, where they start up French language journals criticizing the absolutism, as it's called, of Louis XIV, criticizing the religious intolerance of Louis XIV. And they are doing this in French, the universal language. So an enormous flood of criticism is provoked by Louis's act of making Protestantism illegal. French Protestants will become the spearhead of this movement, the Enlightenment. And then they've got Locke and Newton to add to the mix. It will mean that criticism of absolute authority, demands for freedom of religion, and demands for freedom of the press will be prime demands of the Enlightenment. Now, how come they get to do this in the Dutch Republic? Is it just because it's Protestant? No. The Dutch Republic, because of its peculiar form of decentralized authority, is incapable of suppressing religious minorities. It would probably have wanted to do so if it could have, but it could not. Therefore, it lets the Jews emigrate after they are kicked out of Spain and Portugal at the end of the 15th and 16th century. They move to the Dutch Republic in some cases. They allow Catholics to practice Catholicism as long as they don't do it publicly. And they allow all kinds of Protestant sects to flourish. This is why the Puritans went from there to Massachusetts Bay Colony. This is why the pilgrims went from there to the New World, because the Dutch would allow anybody to come and stay there. So the Dutch end up with a big French-speaking community publishing books and pamphlets and essays and newspapers criticizing intolerance and a lack of freedom. So this gets things going. 
Between 1715 and 1748, then, the action switches to France because criticism begins to mount within France. Why this is the turning point? Two reasons. One I'll give you now. Louis XIV dies after an incredibly long reign. Louis XIV was king from 1643 to 1715. He outlived his sons and his grandsons and was succeeded by his great-grandson, who was five in 1715. And the person running the government for him had more liberal ideas and allowed a kind of beginning, you know, a kind of Khrushchev liberalization of the regime. They didn't let the Protestants back until 1787, but things were a little more, more liberal. So in France, people begin to write things critical of the previous regime. Of course, they still have to publish them in Amsterdam or London or Switzerland, but it's hard to prevent smuggling across mountain pa passes. Because literally what happens, there are no mountains between, the, needless to say, the Dutch Republic and France. But back roads, they just didn't have the border police that would have been required to prevent all the smuggling that now goes on. I will talk later about why France becomes the center of all of this. We have the early works of Montesquieu and Voltaire in this period. If we had more time, we would talk about them in great length. At the beginning, the church and the state both try to suppress these works. Let me just take one example. You don't need to remember it. Montesquieu's Persian Letters, published in 1721, tells the story, supposedly, of two Persian visitors to France in the last days of Louis XIV. And it makes French customs seem ludicrous. It says, for example, Louis XIV, the king here, this is one of the Persian visitors, it's a very strange place. The king has a mistress who is 80, because Louis is really old, and a minister of state who is 13. So it makes fun of the way things are done in France. It makes fun of the pope. It makes fun of the Catholic Church. So we get the beginnings of criticism. Needless to say, the church and the state try to suppress these works. So they're printed elsewhere and smuggled into the country instead. By 1748, things have really heated up. 1748, the date is just picked because Montesquieu publishes his Spirit of the Laws. You don't need to remember that. The great works of the Enlightenment are published in the 1750s and the 1760s. Rousseau's Social Contract, 1762. Voltaire's Philosophical Dictionary in the 1750s. Voltaire's works on the Kala affair, which I'm going to talk about later, and religious toleration in the 1760s. Now demands are being made for religious toleration, freedom of the press, and in the case of Rousseau, for equality of all men, and for government based on a social contract. And now the lock of the second treatise comes into play. It's translated into French in 1755, published in Amsterdam, of course, and becomes an important source for the French Enlightenment in the 1750s and 1760s. So all kinds of new ideas are taking shape in the 1750s and 1760s. The state is trying to suppress these works. All works published in France have to have permission from the king. The person in charge of censorship, however, is being won over to the Enlightenment. So the works are suppressed in the 1750s, and starting in the 1760s, increasingly, these works are allowed to be published in France. Not Rousseau. Rousseau is burnt, his works are burned in Geneva and in Paris, because they are much too radical. But the encyclopedia is able to be published tacitly in France in the 1760s, whereas it was suppressed in the 1750s. So in the 1760s, 
increasingly the members of the government itself in France are being won over to Enlightenment ideas. This is the high period. It's also the time of Hume and Smith in Scotland. And then, of course, the period, I say, ends in 1776. Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations, but also the American Revolution, which in many ways puts these ideas into practice. And by now, rulers have embraced these ideas in France itself. And indeed, this will be the tremendous problem for the French monarchy. It is desperately trying to modernize. It is picking up Enlightenment ideas. And it is its failure to be able to implement them which will cause the French Revolution, as we will talk about on Thursday. How crucial is the Enlightenment in the long run? Many people would argue that the places that had the strongest relationship to the Enlightenment, England, France, Western Germany, Northern Italy, the British American colonies, were the ones that would become democratic areas first. That there was a relationship between these ideas, that places that did not have Enlightenment in the same way, Russia, Spain, and southern, Central and Southern Italy would increasingly fall behind. The really interesting intermediate case is the German Enlightenment, which is much more about religion and much less about politics. And many people would argue the problem of Germany up to World War II is precisely this mixture. You could have ideas, especially about religion and philosophy, but it was very difficult to turn them into political criticism. Intellectuals tended not to challenge the state, and some would see this as a cause of Germany's later problems. OK, so just a brief, I'm going to, yes, I may make noise, but I've got to show something on the map. Can you, can you hear me? Sort of. Stand up. You think you, you, think you understand this? In, it, yeah, you're right. How did you know that? Oh, you think that's what it is. Okay, I'll put it over here. Good. All right. Over. All right. I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah, move the podium. Great. Thank you so much. What is your name? Isaac. I doubt, but. Makes a difference. Can't be lower, but they knew last time I used them. Okay. <laughs> the map quiz next week will be on, not this map, it will be on Europe after the Congress of Vienna, 1815. So study that map for the map quiz. OK, the map. Okay, that's not working either. It's at the, yeah, just at the.
stuff to come here. Okay. So, why the 18th century? This is the first reason is a fascinating fact that too many of us don't pay attention to. The early 18th century is a period of global warming. More importantly, the 17th century was a period of global cooling. The 17th century was a period, therefore, of economic depression. Why was this? Temperatures were, on average, two or three degrees lower in the 17th century. But this meant there was more rain, less sunshine, less heat to grow crops, greater chance of famine. Greater chance of famine meant greater possibilities for epidemic diseases. And the plague was a constant problem in the 17th century. In 1720, the plague appears for the last time in Europe. No one, in fact, knows why it disappears, and no, because no one understood that it came from rats, originally from Asia, brought on ships to Europe. For whatever reason, they think maybe a bigger rat ate the smaller rat that carried the plague. No one is entirely sure. After 1720 in Marseille, southern France, there is no plague in the 18th century, or ever after, unless it's brought back by biological warfare. Uh, it's warmer. There's a little less rain. Crops are better. And we have the beginning of a population explosion in the 18th century. Starting from the 1720s onward, there is no longer a kind of iron ceiling to population growth. The entire history of humanity before the 18th century was marked by increases and then decreases in population. Increases in populations, decreases in population. Increase in population, shortage of food, decrease in population, epidemic disease. Increases in population, decreases in population. Now population will go up steadily from the 18th century to this time. There will be bad times, as there are now. There will be crop disasters, are there, as there are periodically. A crop disaster will bring about the French Revolution. On the whole, there is more food, there are more people, and this will be a prime element in bringing about, eventually, the Industrial Revolution. This change makes it possible now to be optimistic. The notion of progress is now possible. Maybe if I turn this down a little, I'm going to find out what the story is here. This is supposed to be a modern classroom. OK, so global warming, new attitudes are possible. Growing population. Some of them are moving to the cities. Growing cities, especially London. Growing middle class in the cities, which will result, as I said last time, in new cultural forms. These new cultural forms include coffee houses. Coffee houses are first set up by Armenian merchants in Paris in the late 17th century. Coffee has long been known. It's only grown in Yemen in the Middle East at this time. In 1707, the Dutch figure out how to domesticate coffee. They take the plants from the Middle East. They grow them in hothouses in Holland. And they ship them by plants to their new colonies in Indonesia, in particular the island. Which island do you think it might be? Java. That's why it was called for a cup of Java for a long time. The Dutch learn how to grow coffee in Java. Coffee production is then begins to spread also to South America uh, and the Caribbean colonies, especially in the 18th century. Coffee leads to coffee houses. Coffee houses lead to newspapers, because that's where you read newspapers. Newspapers and coffee houses lead to political criticism. You have the public concert, as I mentioned, first appearing in the early 18th century. You have public art exhibitions, along with them pamphlets criticizing art for the new public. You have a musical public. You have an artistic public. And you have the creation of new forms of sociability, in particular the Masonic lodges, which appear first in Scotland and then in England at the end of the 17th and early 18th century, and spread systematically across Europe from west to east in the course of the 18th century. They are 
1738, you are supposedly excommunicated if you become a Mason. Masonic societies are secret. They allow men, because outside of the Dutch Republic, there are no, there, women's lodges are only auxiliary. Women are not in the lodges. They allow men to discuss the problems of the day, the needs for philanthropy, and they allow them to socialize across class lines. Lodges have aristocrats. The Grand Master of France on the eve of the French Revolution is the king's brother. We are not talking about an anti-aristocratic movement. It allows artisans to have lodges, middle classes to have lodges, aristocrats to have lodges, they have their own lodges, but it is possible to drop social distinctions because in the lodge you are all brothers. This is the source of the notion of fraternity, is the Masonic lodges, including our fraternities at the university, but also, as we will see in the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. This will become an important background, and I just mentioned in passing, that Masons will become part of Hitler's favorite enemies, the Jewish Masonic conspiracy. Masons have been a subject of endless speculation and interest since the 18th century. For us, they are a relatively anodyne group who get together to discuss the needs for philanthropy, to raise money for good causes, but also they have constitutions, and this helps spread the notion of constitutional practice. As a result of this new public, public opinion becomes a force. Increasingly, you cannot do things as a monarch that the public disapproves of. That's just the way it is. OK. Keeping in mind, behind all of this, the 18th century is also the period when slavery takes off. There is a fantastic rise in the number of slaves imported from Africa to the New World over the course of the 18th century. Decade in which the most slaves are transported to the French colony of Saint-Domingue, now called Haiti, which you can't even see here because, well, yes, you can see here. Here's Haiti. Uh, I'm sorry, here's Haiti, that's Cuba. The decade in which the largest number of slaves are transported to Saint-Domingue, the French colony, now Haiti, is the 1780s. It's a trade in throughout the 18th century. Slavery is the benchmark against which freedom is measured. But it's also the great cruel paradox. The century in which we begin to talk about freedom as necessary to human life is the century in which the largest scale bondage of other people, 11 million in all, not just in the 18th century, but in the whole course of Western slavery, are transported into slavery. And that's not counting the people who died on the voyages. OK. Why France? Why is France homeland of the Enlightenment? Well, I'm going to talk to you about the Kala affair to make this clear why, and to give you a sense of the nitty gritty of the Enlightenment. But basically, the bottom line is the long, is the bottom sentence. France is the home of the Enlightenment because it is a place where the monarchs want to modernize the country, but in which there are still many obstacles to be overcome. Enlightenment does not happen where monarchs decide to repress all signs of dissent. There is no Enlightenment in Spain until very late in the 18th century. There is not much of an enlightenment in Italy. And even in Russia, where Peter the Great founded the first newspaper himself, Catherine allows the publication of nothing that would constitute a criticism of her regime. So you have to have a monarchy that is interested in new ideas and is interested in modernization. But in France, you have this funny intermediate position. 50% of the population is literate, which is way more than Poland or Russia, and way less than England or the Dutch Republic. It has newspapers, 
But no do daily newspapers until the 1780s, whereas England has had them since the 1720s and 30s. It has coffee houses after England. It has Masonic societies, lodges after England. It's in between. It doesn't have the level of freedoms that the Dutch Republic or England has, but it's not as repressive as other places. One major revolution never happens in completely repressive societies. It only happens in places where a government loses confidence in the old ways and is trying to find a new way forward. OK, I want to talk about the specific case of the Kala affair for my last 10 minutes and Voltaire. So for this, I brought in some pictures from my recent book. In a nutshell, you have a little bit on this in the book. In a nutshell, in seven. Ah. Oh my god. In 1761, the son of Kala was found dead in the family's workshop below the family's residence in Toulouse in southwestern France. How many people have been to France? OK, so then you, you presumably know where Toulouse is, down there in the southwest. Uh, kind of nicely rose-colored city. Uh, had an important population of Protestants who were practicing secretly. They find the son dead. They report this to the authorities. The authorities, the police believe that Kala, the, the Kala family, the entire family, has murdered the son because they thought he was going to convert to Catholicism. Protestantism is illegal. Therefore, lots of things are believed about Protestants who are practicing in secret. The police arrest Kala, who's about my age, in his 60s. They arrest his wife. They arrest his son. They arrest his servant. And they arrest the guy who happens to be there on business and is there for dinner. First, the court decides that they shall all be tortured to confess. Torture is legal outside of England. It is legal basically everywhere in the Western world in the 18th century. It has been in use since the 13th century. You have torture to get confessions increasingly falling into disuse. And you have torture to get the names of accomplices once you have been convicted. The higher court steps in and says, no, we're not torturing the whole family. Instead, we're convicting the father. And he's going to be tortured in preliminary torture, preliminary to the ex execution, to get him to name his accomplices. And then he'll tell us that the whole rest of the family did it, and we'll get them all. So this is the kind of torture they used in Toulouse. This is actually from the 16th century. The interesting thing about legal torture is it's very difficult to find a representation of it because it was carried out in secret. There was a judge present. There was a notary present. There was a doctor present to make sure you didn't kill the person that you were torturing. There was a notary there to write down everything that was said. There was a judge there to supervise the proceedings. And so I have shown you here the judge in the century version. Kala was subject to two forms of preliminary torture. One commonly called strappado after the Italian. You have, you see, his, your arm pulled up by a pulley mechanism while your feet are attached to a stone. This is applied, according to the law, in Toulouse twice. Pulling it, you, don't, you dislocate the shoulder, but you tear off the arm. Twice, he does not confess. So we go on to the second form of torture approved in Toulouse. In the case of Kala, it was a little bit different from torture. Kala was tied down to a bench with two small sticks open, all prescribed law. The first, at, OK, are you going to tell us the names of your accomplices? No, I don't have any accomplices. I'm innocent. The second, only two pictures. So carefully controlled, nevertheless, and legally supervised, nevertheless, tortured. And then 
Block, not having and not having given up names of accomplices, was executed. Murderers in France in the 18th century were executed by being tied to an X-shaped cross and having every one of the bones in their bodies broken one by one with an iron rod. After their arms, legs, and stomachs were hit with the iron rod, his body was put on a wheel until they died of their internal injuries. In the case of Columbus, the court was beginning to believe in enlightenment ideas. They ordered that he could be strangled after his bones were broken rather than waiting to die of his internal injuries. Now, Voltaire becomes involved in this case. The fascinating thing is that the 1760s is a turning point. Kala is executed in 1762. Voltaire intervenes in the case in 1764. He gets the rehabilitation of the entire family in 1765 by the Royal Council by arguing vociferously that the only reason that Kala was convicted was because he was a Protestant and Protestantism was illegal. That it was bigotry, fanaticism, and superstition that led to his conviction and execution. Now, in 1763 and 64, when Voltaire wrote against this case, when he fulminated against the French courts for having done this, he never once said that the use of torture or the form of the punishment was wrong. In 1766, he began to say just that. Why? Because he read Beccaria, one of your documents in the source book. Beccaria, a law student, recent law student, 25 years old, having never practiced the law yet, he was an aristocrat from Milan in northern Italy, Beccaria published a book called On Crime, in which he explicitly attacked the use of torture. You have that section in the reader. In which he explicitly attacked the use of cruel punishment and in which he explicitly argued against the death penalty. So far ahead of his time, it was almost unbelievable. Critics, this was immediately translated into French, and critics immediately said, this is just Lightman figures write a book. There's an immediate huge scene about Beccaria's ideas. And what are Beccaria's arguments? Torture doesn't work. The strong deny their guilt. The weak confess to what they have not done. They tell you what you want to hear. What is the argument against cruel punishment? The breaking of people's bones, the burning of people's bodies, the maiming of people, for robbery, for example. In France, you've got a V for voleur branded on your shoulder. This brutalizes society. Pain serves no purpose except to make the individual miserable. It has no social purpose. And so, Beccaria, and with this case, we see the emergence in the 1760s, of the notion that the individual body is inviolable, that it is wrong to tear people's bodies apart, still a possible punishment under the French law if you try to kill the king, torn apart by horse until everything is not dismembered, but truly broken, that this kind of cruel punishment is wrong for social reasons and for individual reasons. So we have the rise of the idea that the individual body is inviolable, that the individual person has rights, that society needs to have freedom of expression for this to be known, and it needs to have freedom of religion so that people don't believe this of other religions. So it comes together in the 18th century, this current of criticism which as we will see in Thursday, on Thursday, will then unleash the torrent that is the French Revolution. See you then.